So let me uh, next up introduce our friend Max, who is going to be in chat, and we are going to be talking a little bit about a post-mortem of a full game release. Uh, there's a lot of cool information in here, so feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, until then, please, round of applause for our friend Max. Hello. I'm Max, and this is a post-mortem for Alicon, a creature photography game our team of three built and released on Steam this June. I'm calling it good based on its 96% review score on Steam, and I'm an expert on not selling it because it sold just 700 copies in its first two months. Let me start by running you through the game loop. You start by taking photos of various creatures in their environments. Initially, the player is on a predefined movement path, similar to Pokemon Snap, which was the original inspiration for this game five years ago. Soon after, you unlock Wander Mode, where you can walk around at your own pace, interact with the environment, solve puzzles, and set up photo opportunities. The photos you take are scored on, uh, based on things like framing, and every creature, we call these creatures fictions, has a set of poses they strike depending on what they are doing. So a swimming jolly flipper counts as one pose, an eating one as a different pose, and so on. You get the poses by interacting with the creatures in their environment, or causing them to behave in different ways. The first time you photograph a fiction, they come to life on Dream's doorstep, uh, the hub area between levels. Here you can talk with the fictions and do their various quests and minigames. These are not typical fetch quests. Each of the 50 plus fictions has its own unique quest and reward. Some are dialogue based, like haggling for a box to store photos or prosecuting a feline fiction for not being vegan. Some are minigames like tossing donuts onto poles, Guitar Hero style rhythm games, or platforming sequences. Rewards are also unique. Most are new customization systems, like being able to plant flowers, dress up fictions, design snowflakes, or turn your photos into jigsaw puzzles. The rest are gameplay abilities, like slowing time or being able to read minds. As you accumulate score from taking photos and completing quests, you unlock new levels until you reach the finale. A typical playthrough is about six hours. If you want to try all the quests, it's about 10 or so. And if you want to 100% the game, it's about 20. Next up are game pillars. These weren't explicitly stated, but we always had an unspoken understanding of what the core game was. First off, photos. The game started as a spiritual successor to Pokemon Snap, so photos were always at the center. As the game evolved, we tried to incorporate them wherever possible. You can edit them with stickers, effects, and color filters based on how each fiction sees the world. You can turn them into jigsaw puzzles. You can even convert a photo into a constellation or an ice sculpture. Although you spend as much time on quests as taking photos, we tried to make sure photography was always on your mind. Second pillar are the characters. These were always core to the game, but as we refined our vision, they became even more important. By the end, they were more of a pillar than photography. Instead of acting like animals, we made fictions into speaking characters with their own personalities. We associated every fiction with a concept, from simple ones like leisure or judgment, to walkier, walkier ones like micromanagement or trying new hobbies and immediately giving up. A fiction's personality, dialogue, quest, and rewards all tie to this association. So for example, for Busy Bird, the seagull-like fiction of micromanagement, your quest is to assign characters to different spots at a beach party to maximize month-over-month -month participation growth. And the reward is access to a dashboard of all fiction poses which you haven't found yet. While creature photography is the basis of many games, elevating creatures into characters is one of the main ways in which Alicon stands out. The third pillar is novelty. Photography games often feel grindy, constantly revisiting areas and taking similar photos. We broke up that monotony by adding dialogues and quests. Although technically they are all optionals, we carefully encourage the player to go back and forth between the two activities. Every time you photograph a new creature, uh, they come to life on Dream's doorstep in a little ceremony, and you can immediately do their quest. Conversely, when you finish a quest, you sometimes get abilities to use during photography. Both taking photos and completing quests progresses you towards unlocking new levels. We also use simpler tricks like making you pass by quest givers uh, with enticing exclamation marks when returning from the scoreboard to the level select portal. Finally, uh, keeping the experience immersive. Most feedback in the game is delivered in by in-world particles, animations, and thought bubbles. The only uh, HUD is the translucent reticle, which is designed to be minimal but show contextual info like cooldowns, zoom level, and how you can interact with a targeted object. We were also careful to never mention out-of-world concepts like tutorial input prompts within in-world dialogue. Next, let's talk about themes. 
Our main goal was to deliver an experience of childlike wonder. We tried to capture that feeling of getting a new game or book as a kid and going on an unpredictable magical adventure. We built a whimsical, colorful world where waltzing penguins and daunt bearing trees are common, the inhabitants are wacky over-the-top characters, the mood is joyful, and discovery lies behind every corner. The theme most explicitly presented by the game is creativity. The main story is about recovering the boundless childlike creativity which one loses as they grow up. Undiscovered creatures and areas appear as gray sketches encased in what we call dullness, representing creative memories that are no longer vivid in your imagination. Creative actions grant glimmers of creativity which counter dullness and bring the world back to life. Although the theme is not explored in very much depth, it did strike a chord with players who have struggled with creative blocks. I've seen a streamer move to tears by the ending as they reflected on their own difficulties making art. Finally, we think too few games celebrate nonviolent solutions to problems, so everything you do in Alicon is about helping and creating rather than fighting. The project was started by Kevin, who works as a composer and audio engineer in AAA. He's worked for Riot Games, Respawn, and other large studios. Daniel is an animator by trade and was responsible for designing, modeling, and animating all the creatures in the game. He also worked at Riot and currently works at Player First Games. I'm a software engineer, previously at Google and Riot, but I was a modder first, so I'm a jack of all trades, really. Uh, we worked for about two years together at Riot on a game that got canceled, and while I wasn't involved with Alicon from the very beginning, we reconnected after I quit Riot and moved to Portland. Uh, we worked remotely, and I haven't even seen my teammates in person since I joined the project in 2018. Speaking of that, let's go over the timeline. Kevin started the project in May of 2016 and spent four years prototyping on weekends. Daniel built many of the character models and animations during this period. Early on, other coworkers helped with concept art and puzzle mechanics. This phase explored different themes, settings, and technical directions like mobile and VR. I joined near the end of 2018 and handled most of the tech and gameplay from then on. Although at this point, I spent only a few hours a week on the project. When COVID hit, we decided to start working on the game seriously. Kevin still had a day job, but spent most of his free time working on Alicon, while I worked on it full time. During this phase, we were still making fundamental changes, like adding free roam movement, making fictions talk and give quests, splitting and merging levels, and so on. By November 2020, we had a pretty clear idea of the final product, and set a target to release a demo in February and the final game at the end of May. Production was uh, all hands on deck. Kevin and I both worked on the game full time. Daniel uh, had less to do since most of the character models and animations were done, but continued to regularly support us with new and improved animations. We released the demo in February as planned and hit our final release target as well, though it was moved to June to participate in E3. Unlike most of my past projects, our estimates turned out pretty accurate. To a large extent, this was because we had a tiny team and a lot of experience with the tools. We did end up crunching for the last few months, working 12 hours a day, seven days a week with an occasional mental health day off. It's not for everyone, but it works in this case as it fit neatly into the last part of the COVID lockdown, ending just before general vaccine av availability. So how did we build it? Most importantly was collaboration. With three people and no game designers or environment artists, we had to be flexible. Daniel mostly worked on his own, making and animating the characters in Maya, while Kevin and I worked closely. As an audio engineer, Kevin did all of the audio from composing two hours of original music to setting up sound effects in the engine. He also learned level design, and while I made a couple areas, he built most of the world. I handled all of the code, implementing gameplay logic, optimizing, deploying, and so on. I also covered UX, designing the flows, creating art assets, and implementing them in engine. Uh, writing and game design were more collaborative. Our writing styles and senses of humor differ greatly, so just mixing them couldn't work. We settled on Kevin writing most of the character dialogue and me writing less character-driven parts like post description and lore giving during scoring. The few characters that I ended up writing still fit in though, as all the text for the same character is consistent. I had experienced merging text written by many different authors into a consistent style uh, back from my modding days, so I did all the final editing. The text ended up being over 50,000 words. Uh, game design was even more collaborative. Brainstorms often had Kevin driving the high-level ideas. After that, I would expand the chosen idea into gameplay mechanics and write a prototype. We would test and iterate back and forth. Then I would implement the final logic, and Kevin would do final tweaks for difficulty and audiovisuals. Some of our hardest brainstorms were fiction names. 
When you introduce 50 characters within five hours, they have to be really distinct. We ended up using a mixture of portmanteaus like Curicarp, the fish fiction of curiosity, puns like artilope, the gazelle fiction of ice sculpture, nicknames like Lil Char, the lava fish fiction of rap battles, and titles like the captain or father ostrix, uh, plus a few with no meaning like Japli. Most characters went through four or five names. In one case, we had to change name after the de uh, demo shipped because it was a curse word in some Spanish dialects. The replacement turned out to be a curse word in Hungarian, but oh well, you can't have it all. Uh, one key to our success was focusing on our strengths. For example, 95% of our environments are kit bashed from free or cheap and real marketplace packages. I made a lot of custom materials and Kevin used lighting and environmental effects heavily. And through that, we managed to make it all look pretty consistent. The environment art style was something many players called out as a major highlight, in fact. Another example, since we had a dedicated audio engineer, we made a bunch of music mini games from the classical uh, Guitar Hero style rhythm game to tuning instruments to a metal detector that fades in orchestral, com uh, ah, orchestral com accompaniment to the music when you are close to a target. Uh, by the time we got to production, Kevin and I were heavily invested in the game and had a lot of disagreements, mainly about writing and UX. In most cases, we compromised or found a workable alternative, but during crunch, it got heated enough a few times that we had to walk away from an argument and come back the next day after we had cooled off, which worked for us. Uh, we're both pretty easygoing people and have uh, worked on large teams with strong opinions which helped us navigate this, but it was harder than working on a team where each creative decision has a clear owner with a final say. Alicon is built on Unreal Engine 4, although everything I say here applies just as much to Unreal Engine 5. Uh, the engine choice was just because the people initially involved had lots of UE experience. Most of the game is implemented in Blueprints, uh, UE's visual scripting language. Uh, we have about a thousand Blueprints, a quarter of that UI, another quarter subclasses with no custom logic. Uh, there are only a couple thousand lines of C++ to glue things together, expose APIs, or do low-level things like read, write, save games. I would prefer text, but using C++ for game logic in UE4 is slow and painful. There are shortcuts like hot reload, but, but they are very buggy and still an order of magnitude slower than writing a blueprint. Still, blueprint is the best visual scripting language I've used, and it's integrated very deeply in UE. You can use it for all gameplay and UI logic, development tools, editor customizations, and so on. It's also trivial to expose C++ structs and functions. One notable advantage over C++ is that you can write asynchronous sequences in line with nodes that run across many frames. For example, our scoring ceremony loop, which can take 10 seconds per iteration, is a single blueprint node sequence. While we struggled with GPU performance, we only hit CPU bottlenecks due to bugs and tiny hotspots, which were easy to move to C++. You can even nativize blueprints, which transforms them into C++, then compiles them to native. Uh, this had measurable impact on CPU time for us, but being GPU bound, it didn't matter on most systems. The biggest issue with Blueprints is version control. They're binary files, so you can merge them, uh, so you cannot merge them, and the diffing tool is limited and clunky. Uh, tracking down regressions takes forever. Um, I did most of the Blueprint edits myself, so this was less of a problem on Alicon, but with several people regularly editing a Blueprint, it's a huge pain. Uh, for UI, we use the built-in uh, UI system, UMG. Thanks to deep integration with Blueprint, uh, connecting gameplay logic to it was a breeze, and the system is quite flexible. Most notably, any image can be switched to a shader, which allows completely custom visuals. Aside from a few specific bugs, my main complaint is that it requires boilerplate. For example, you can't dynamically spawn built-in widgets, so you are forced to create wrappers for simple things like buttons and labels. You also can't control style globally like you would using CSS in a web app. So for example, you can't switch a font across the whole UI without changing every widget that has text in it or using wrapper widgets for all text. One technique that we used for our UI is animating 2D distance fields. You can convert any SVG vector shape into a texture like the red one here, then draw an approximate animation timing gradient and combine them with a very cheap shader to get a smooth animation like you see on the cloud and the logo. I have a tutorial for this at alicongame.com slash morph with a public domain UE project, but it can be ported to other engines in about half an hour. A significant advantage of UE is the integrated art tools. The material editor is super powerful, but approachable by both artists and non-graphics engineers. The particle editors are super flexible, though right now the older one that we used, Cascade, is being replaced by a new one called Niagara, 
which is more powerful but requires deeper understanding. There's even a simple mesh editor which, used, uh, which I used regularly to tweak marketplace assets and make simple props. There's also a new in-engine rigging and animation system, though we didn't use that one. Um, I was able to spend 95% of my time in the editor. One problem with that is that the editor crashes regularly, multiple times a day. From perfectly innocent actions like pasting something into an unexpected place, I can sometimes recover by running the editor in a debugger, but that isn't an option for most, and it wastes a lot of time. Version upgrades are similarly unstable. When I joined Alicon uh, was on UE 4.19, and we shipped on 4.26. Every update introduced new bugs. These were not deprecated features or big announced changes, but subtle undocumented differences. One bug in 4.26 completely changed UI scaling, a clear regression, and the third highest quoted issue on their bug tracker. Yet even though I posted the commit that caused it many months ago, it still isn't fixed. To ship Alicon without a custom engine build, I had to use an ugly, unportable hack. Documentation beyond the basics is also very spotty, and you often have to rely on tribal lore scattered around the internet. We used a few plugins, but the only one of note is Wise, which handled all of our audio. Kevin used it for his AAA work, and while it was a bit of an overkill for Alicon, its profiling and debugging tools put it far ahead of UE's system. So, the game world is split into a large hub map and independent level maps. All of these are sublevels of the persistent uh, map. We asynchronously load and unload the sublevels and cover it up with a traveling through a portal animation implemented as a post process material. This setup is convenient since you always maintain game state, but stuttering during loading is unavoidable. Top image here is the smallest of the main levels, and the lower image is the hub. On the hub, we have little pocket wards outside the main walkable area for specific quests like a forest courthouse or a beach party scene. We use standard UE pawns, controllers, and AI, though input is routed to our tools system. Each ability from jumping to taking photos to moving magnets is a separate tool blueprint, which we can enable or disable for each minigame. Minigames and rewards are station blueprints. We have over 100 of these. They handle taking control of the camera, selecting tools, and implementing gameplay logic. This setup let us implement dozens of unique minigames and rewards in a few months. Our dialogue and quest systems are about the same as any other games. Overall, I focus on minimizing complexity. Half an engineer's work is deciding when introducing new abstractions is worthwhile, and people often make complicated systems prematurely. Our save game system is simple. Photos are JPEGs, and all other data is plain JSON. A human editable format makes for easy debugging. Whenever any persistent state changes, we write a new saved game on a separate thread and swap the save ID. Re-encoding and writing even three megs of JSON in the background is still essentially instant. We store three types of data. First is tags. These are global symbols that can only be added or removed. They're used throughout the game to track global state, like whether a given quest has been started, whether a given ability has been unlocked, or a given puzzle solved. You can hardly find a dialogue or blueprint that doesn't interact with tags. Photo metadata describes the subjects in the photo, including bounds, distance, and angle to the camera, obstructions, and bone transform. This allows scoring and reproducing 3D meshes out of captured photos, using, used in rewards like Christmas tree decorations and character-shaped fireworks. Finally, game objects can access a private dictionary by an ID, usually a customization station's path in the map, to store arbitrary key-value pairs of strings. This is used mainly to store player customizations like colors and placement transforms. For testing and debugging, we had a config blueprint with toggleable cheats and shortcuts, plus several in-game UIs to manipulate game state and trigger events. We also had an alternative game mode for running a single level to iterate without loading the hub. Unlike testing specific features, playtesting involved playing through the whole game like a real player would. We often did this ourselves, but more, more importantly, we had friends play through the game and stream it to us. I cannot overstate how useful this was. We came out of each playtest with over 100 notes from specific things like certain UIs or quest goals being unclear to major conclusions like player engagement with different types of content. For instance, our quests initially ask the player to do something in a level, then turn it in at the hub. Most play players ignored these quests. When they did engage, it looked more like MMO fetch quests. This drove us to change most quests to happen immediately after accepting them as dialogues or minigames, and players engage with that much more. Playtest continues all the way to release. Now, the less fun side of this talk, selling the game. The game wasn't designed with profit in mind. 
It's a PC-only, single playthrough game with no multiplayer, social elements, DLC, player-made content, or any other monetization, and it's in a very niche genre. We all had day jobs in AAA, and I'm semi-retired, so it was a passion project rather than a business. If our livelihood depended on commercial success, we would have never made this game. One of our mistakes was starting late. Kevin was worried about showing work in progress content, so it took a lot of persuasion to convince him to even announce the game four months before release. For an indie project, that's not really an option. You need time to gather enough interest for a splash at launch and enough wish list for Steam to promote your game. Alcan started as a spiritual successor to Pokemon Snap, and while the game evolved into something very different, we did count on that nostalgia to factor into its appeal. New Pokemon Snap was announced last year. This could have overshadowed Alicon or helped us reignite interest in the genre. More on that later. Before starting Outreach, I went through the player reviews of dozens of related Steam games. Repetitiveness and bugs were among the top complaints, while ambience uh, often came up in positive reviews. This informed, me, uh, informed some development decisions and how we represented the game during marketing. Many cared about the price to length ratio too. I plotted a dollar per hour range for each game against mentions of good or bad value in its reviews. Complaints disappeared at about two and a half dollars per hour for minimum playtime and about one and a half for maximum playtime. That's how we derived the price. Six hours minimum at 250 is 15 bucks and 15 hours maximum at 150 is 22 and a half. We priced it at 15.99. Is this a great way to price a game? Probably not but it ensured that people felt they got their money's worth. We announced the game and debuted the demo at the Steam Game Festival this February. We got some interest on social media and Twitch and two and a half thousand wish lists. It was the most impactful marketing event until the release, so if you've got a demo for your indie game, you should definitely participate in the Steam Festival. Our demo is about a quarter of the game and two hours of content if you include all the optional stuff. People like this, but we are still unsure if it was the right call. It ensures that only people who like the game buy it, but some may get a satisfying enough experience to never bother getting the full game at all. A few people who played the demo joined our Discord and gave tons of feedback, both from the demo and from later pre-release playtests, which was very useful. From announcement to release, four months in total, every morning I would tweet a new GIF or video highlighting a feature or aspect of the game. This was pretty fun, and while none went viral, we averaged 20 to 30 likes, uh, with the occasional tweet going above 100. This had no tangible impact on sales, though. The more valuable aspect of Twitter was meeting, meeting uh, indie devs, streamers, and event organizers. It's how we got in touch with Wholesome Games and signed up for Wholesome Direct, an online streaming event promoting Wholesome Games that ran as part of E3. In exchange for releasing the game during the event, we had our minute-long trailer shown to much of E3's online audience. We also sent emails to journalists and gaming news sites. We first made a polished press kit with a gigabyte worth of assets, trailers, GIFs, character cutouts, music tracks, UI elements, anything you might need. This was useful for YouTubers, but made no difference to the press. <clears throat> we sent roughly 20 emails for the demo and 50 of, uh, for the final release. These were super targeted, personalized, short, included a Steam key and a couple screenshots, and links to the trailer and press kit. We got five responses and only two or three articles, none on major sites. I expect it was because we lacked notability. A few journalists contacted us unprompted, which resulted in articles, but as, uh, only on small sites with little impact. We considered getting professional help from marketing agencies. One was fully booked and had a minimum fee of 10K. Another was available, but they spent half the introductory call talking down to us, explaining how we were wrong about everything, and repeating that they specialize in helping clueless devs. Their offer was also 10K. They were probably right, but paying 10K to be constantly berated for the next few months did not sound fun. They also said that they employed moderators on large gaming subreddits so they could get us promoted there, which raised ethical concerns. The last agency was least impressive, but offered a press release blast for a few thousand uh, press contacts for $900. We expected little and were fine gambling with that much money. This was mostly useless. We got 30 to 40 responses, mostly from small YouTubers, which made no impact. The bulk of our marketing budget went to Keymailer. For those unfamiliar, it's a service that lets streamers and YouTubers ask devs 
or promo keys to stream the game or record video coverage. We were running out of options as Lynch approached and spent about uh, $2,500 to get Alcan featured on the Keymailer homepage. We got hundreds of requests and granted about 200 of them. But the vast majority of these had below 200 concurrent viewers, so while it did have a small impact, it wasn't profitable, profitable by any measure. Uh, that said, not everything is sales. Most of the joy I got from this release was watching streamers play and enjoy the game, and occasionally dropping by to chat with them. They were also playtests. Most of the changes in the nine patches since release were inspired by seeing what streamers struggled with, and this earned us a lot of goodwill. Then there's the Steam curators. Uh, a few are genuine, but the vast majority are game collectors who trade positive reviews for keys. We got dozens of emails asking for review keys. They're phrased for plausible deniability, but it's clearly quid pro quo. We ended up granted a few before we caught on to what was happening. Uh, we launched the game on June 12th on the Wholesome Direct broadcast, which ran as part of E3. Although we worried about launching along with tons of other announcements, I don't think we could have made a bigger splash without a major promotional campaign. Most players we've spoken to said they found the game from the E3 broadcast. Player reception was almost universally positive with a 96% rating on Steam. People liked the cute creatures, colorful environment, music, and gameplay variety. Performance was an issue for some, but bugs were rare and we promptly fixed those. Uh, the dozens or so press reviews we got were mostly positive, except for one article that gave it a 6 out of 10 and ignored all features that were different from Snap. They, uh, they later posted the same review on Steam with a playtime of an hour and a half, so lesson learned. Even professional reviews are not going to play through your whole game. New Pokemon Snap released two months before us and had mostly negative impact. Those who wanted to relive their nostalgic experience got it from Snap, and many in our target audience dismissed Alicon as a Snap clone before trying. You could see examples of that during the E3 coverage in uh, stream chat, on social media, and in E3 summary articles. Those that played the game mostly found it comparable or preferable to Snap. We sold about 700 copies in the first two months, about 300 during release week, 300 when we put it on a 25% sale for a week, and about 100 scattered in between. For the demo, we uh, got about 7,000 people to install it, but only 2,000 ever launched it. Wishlists fared better. We launched with about uh, 3,500, and by now it's about 10,000. It's unclear how low a discount would convert a significant chunk of that. We got a fair amount of people offering to work on the game, mostly musicians, but we didn't need any help there. There were also many localization offers, but we would have lost money on those. Several publishers offered to bring the game to other platforms, but none of those talks went anywhere. The small publishers offered no value, and the big ones lost interest, presumably from Lockluster sales. Uh, we run a Discord server with about 100 members, a dozen of whom participate regularly. It's a very friendly place, and when new people drop by with a question, they're immediately helped. It's by no means a lively place, but we get a nice conversation going once in a while, and the feedback really helped polish the game before and after release. In conclusion, this was a fun journey. Finishing and polishing the game was very satisfying, and watching people play it is incredibly rewarding. Commercial fail failure was no surprise, but it did reinforce my belief that at least for the kind of game I want to make, the indie path is not a reliable way to make a living. Luckily, I don't depend on it for my livelihood, but if I make games in the future, they might be lower scope or non-commercial at all. Thanks for listening, and I'll leave you now with the Alicon trailer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Max. That was great. Um, thank you so much for putting all of that info together. Um, it is, uh, as some people are commenting in chat, 
uh, one, difficult to uh, talk about absolutely everything that went into your process and uh, be transparent about that and feel comfortable with being transparent about that. But also, um, I, would, I would very much recommend if you have the availability to do similar postmortems with your game jam projects, with anything that you sell, whether it's a game or with an art project or anything like that, just think a lot about how that stuff fits in, what you can learn from it. Um, I mean, as as Max uh, just put things down on the page here for us to look at, it can really like really open your eyes, and uh, it's also so helpful for people in our community to be able to learn from each other because uh, not a lot of people share that kind of information. Not a lot of people share that data. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, really cool to see your tech process. Really cool to see the uh, kind of result of your marketing efforts, uh, even down to talking about numbers with money and all that other kind of stuff. It's just like so, so valuable. I could see just everybody lighting up in the chat saying just like, oh, wow. I like seeing these graphs, like this is very helpful. Um, I also think, uh, yeah, all of your honesty and uh, all, of, all of your honesty is so funny how it leads directly into just like so many things I have very similar experiences with and, and agree with you on. So um, it's, it's nice to know that uh, a lot of people are having very similar experiences with what they do and don't find uh, working and or how to uh, how to think about how to structure your process or anything like that. It's it's really, really cool. Um, also, so interesting. I, I remember when I played your game at first for the Steam uh, Summer Festival and how very nearby I heard about Pokemon Snap and I was just like, oh, dang it. <laughs> like, um, you know, it's uh, I think it's very, very fair of you to think about just like, oh, yeah, this could help. This could hurt. And uh, in the end, kind of who knows? Um, but at the same time, I think uh, you have you have a lot of uh, really really good instincts about uh, all the information that you're gathering, um, at least based on my personal experiences in watching talks and, and uh, hearing from uh, industry uh, showcases with Steam and everything like that. So um, yeah, I guess uh, if anybody has additional questions for Max uh, in the future, uh, feel free to reach out in the Discord and everything like that. Um, so, so helpful. 